Hello, Anne. Hi, John. <laughs> Thanks for agreeing to uh, be interviewed. Yeah, thank you. First of all, how did you actually get started in the lighting industry? What What was the first spark, well, as it were? Well, I, you know, it's, you'll you'll hear lots of people talk about, um, you know, when they were kids, they did this or that, and I got the same thing. And I grew up in Buffalo, New York, which is cold, very cold, dark snowy freezing winters and the house that I grew up in was blocks away from um, the local theaters so there was a regional theater that shows were being produced on a professional scale and then there was a touring house that it turned it was a concert touring house and a Philharmonic and the Philharmonic house but the pro concert promoter at that time was Harvey Weinstein Wow. or Weinstein so um, and he was the local promoter this is before he became a movie mogul and so <clears throat> there were concerts there plays there so I volunteered um, I started volunteering as an usher from the time I was like 12 years old so I was either volunteering for the theater or volunteering and then um, I just loved the environment and I <clears throat> decided that I was never leaving and <laughs> staying there and I would um, you know I went from ushering to you know helping the crews cut gels they'd let the little kid cut gels because they were so pretty and stuff and and um, and then I um, kind of you know um, ran off with um, at one point, I, I decided I really wanted to run away with the theater, and I ran away with the theater, and um, and you know, um, went on tour with like I think it was Steppenwolf or Jimmy mm -hmm. Cliff or one of those things, and with the sound and the lighting, people were like, "Sure, you can help us," and I was a stowaway. It was ridiculous, and and I met um, at that time. Uh, Frank Zappa's lighting designer who was talking about light in really interesting ways and so I was I loved concerts and all that and so I decided to study it so I went to university in Buffalo the University of New York for a few years and had a wonderful teacher Ken Debochnik who was then the resident designer at the New York City Ballet and I took a few classes but I couldn't really afford college so I needed to work and I wanted to work it so I went to um, San Francisco um, which is not the town you go to for theater, but it was the town for punk rock. So I um, decided I wanted to light bands and do theater, and so I was working in um, nightclubs there. I got my first job doing lighting from the um, in a rock in a big rock palace that's now a Broadway touring house in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Theater. But at that time. It was five bands a night, and the person managing it was this um, drag queen Pearl, who was the friend of Janis Joplin, who apparently Janis Joplin took the name Pearl from her record album from this uh, tall uh, black drag queen who hired me when I walked in the door. Uh, I, they were just opening, and I thought I would just get a job as a, you know, um, a waiter or a waitress or something you know I didn't know that I, I just took a couple classes in college I wasn't really prepared for that but they had some, nobody to do lights yet and they had a big stage it was a, it's a huge was a huge stage and and they had a preset board and I didn't really I, I knew a little bit about it but I didn't know how to do lights for music I just seen it and so I you know she hired me on the spot and I you know got um the crash course that first night when she was screaming at me to <laughs> go faster with the lights and you know it, it uh, yeah it was pretty incredible but and then I I started also working at the theater there uh, it was the Magic Theater which was where um, Sam Shepard was and um, Danny Glover and Ed Harris that were all working there at the time but I didn't know how famous they were um, and I certainly didn't know much about Sam Shepard at all. Um, I, when I met him at a, a party before I started working there, he said he was a truck driver. Um, and he was the only person to be wearing kind of a truck drive baseball cap and longer hair and a plaid shirt and jeans. And everybody else was a punk rocker. And um, it was, um, you know, he was kind of an outcast at this 
party in a way, or he was kind of to the side, and and I was talking to him, and he asked me if I liked theater, and I, I just said I hadn't read a play I liked yet, really, and so he gave me Suicide and Be Flat to read that he had just written, but I didn't know who he was, and uh, it turns out uh, when I read it, I was pretty much blown away and decided, you know, I'm going to stop doing this music stuff for a while, and, and this is really important work, and, you know, my friends were telling me, you know, that guy is not a truck driver, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, you know, but I had no idea at the time, and so, and I, um, thanks to him, um, I got to start running lights for plays at the Magic Theater instead of, you know, making fake blood backstage and stuff, and, um, and the artistic director gave me my first show there, so... Um, I was doing that, and I, simultaneously I was also still working at clubs sometimes, and um, I was doing um, electrician. I became a roadie for a little while, and I went on tour uh, as an electrician with um, Rick Danko of the band, and Carlos Santana, and Eddie Money, and different people. I'm, I think my first tour was Mel Torme and Debbie Boone, but, um, but after a while, I wasn't allowed to um, progress upwards into actually being the designer or running the lights, because that was forbidden in those days for women to be in those positions. It was um, enough that I was even allowed on the crew and mm -hmm. believe me there's a lot of stories about that because it, they didn't make it easy mm -hmm. but I was kind of determined and tried not to let it bother me but at the same time I realized I wasn't going to get to actually be a designer and be artistic with the with this um, medium at all because there was just the times weren't ready time wasn't right no matter how I fought it but in theater at the Magic Theater, uh, at one point, Sam Shepard had brought in Beverly Emmons to do Tongues and Savage Love with Joe Chaikin. And, and it was an amazing production, and I, um, well, I was uh, uh, assigned to be her assistant, but I didn't know what a real assistant did, so I didn't show up for the first day of tech rehearsal because I didn't think I had to. I thought I would just take notes during the show. It was pretty funny, but she was very kind to me. and. Um, and subsequently, after a while, when San Francisco was, the days were San Francisco was pre-AIDS, and so it was very wild. It was just people of, uh, you know, young people of a certain generation were just out of their minds on drugs, and um, everything was going on, and, and, um, and homosexual, homosexuality was starting to come out. People were coming out. It was very free. Everything was crazy people stayed up all night and um, I was getting kind of wrapped up in that lifestyle while trying to work and um, Sam Shepard at one point told me you know look if you want to stay alive you better go to New York and here's some people to look up so he gave me the name of um, Ellen Stewart from La Mama Theater um, Maria Irene Fornes, the playwright, and um, and Johnny Dodd, who was a lighting designer for Off Off Broadway, who became kind of my mentor, you know, and who took me in. So I went to New York. I got on a bus, got out of there, and found all those people uh, one by one, and they all were generous and took me in. And I started working at La Mama, and I started doing plays with Maria Irene Fornes, who is one of my favorite people in the world and one of the most brilliant people I think you know of our generation writers with, along with Sam um, and um, and I was you know schooled at how not to do things by Johnny Dodd who, who no one will hear much about except Andy Warhol he was in the Andy Warhol scene a little bit so Andy Warhol has mentioned him in a few books but he was really the first part that was when Off Off Broadway started and he was the guy the only guy doing lights at that time because it was coffee cans and switches and it all started at Cafe Chino and I'm not sure if you know the history of Off no, Off Broadway but really. But it started on Cornelia Street in Greenwich Village in the late 50s. Um, and so, but he was very Dada-esque and very avant-garde. And, and um, his um, comrades were um, Julian Beck and Judith Molina from the um, Living Theater and Joe Chaikin from the... 
uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of his theater. I am might be getting it mixed up. But they were amazing people, really um, involved in experimental and um, uh, really turning around the narratives and really being the surrealists and, you know, uh, in the kind of spirit of Bunuel and, and all this stuff, doing really interesting stuff. And, you know, Johnny's a way of lighting... Um, Shakespeare was a green front light and magenta backlight and doing the whole thing, you know, like, whoa, you know, it was so psychedelic and so crazy. Those were the times. So I was happy to um, pick, up the, pick up the style for a while so I can kind of free myself from the conventions of what I thought lighting was to then break through to my own style because so, so... You know, that led to doing a lot of work and off, off-Broadway, then off-Broadway. Then I got my first Broadway show, and and then uh, and then I went to Disney <laughs> after a while because I couldn't make any money doing that kind of stuff. Because um, at that time, it wasn't, you know, our um, idea of a successful career. People had different ideas, and mine was never to be... Uh, I, I, Broadway wasn't my goal. My goal was to do interesting work and to create interesting art and be around interesting people. And I didn't see Broadway musicals as something that was that uh, um, intellectually evolved and artistically evolved at that time. And I mean, um, it's surely come a long way from there. But um, and dramas didn't uh, get you rich royalties because they weren't going to be extended all that long you know especially when um uh it was serious subject matter you know people were interested in seeing it but it wasn't like you know everybody's gonna i mean i did this one show the one broadway show i did was with robert de niro and it ran longer because it was robert de niro but it was very heavy subject matter it wasn't gonna go on tour or anything like that so um i needed money and i decided to just take a break and went to Disney for a while and designed to in park lighting and, and then left there and here I am. So <laughs>
that was a connection, a physical connection between the technical artist and the artist on stage. Um, so th for me that was the biggest thing because I've seen, uh, I've been around for the advent of moving lights in both theater and concerts and saw what that did, fourth dimension, there's movement now. So we had, you know, intensity, we had shifts, we had calling, now we've got uh, and we had timing, you know, computer timing, and now we've got this other movement. So how do you do that and, you know, and, and make that something that, um, you know, everybody wanted to just move them around a lot because they can move around a lot. And so we just had to say, wait a minute, I don't want to be part of this madness. What, what happened to the craft? So um, it was really kind of learning how to harness that and appreciate it and accept it now it's second nature um, you know pre-visualization being able to have to show somebody what you're gonna do before you do it and have it look like something I mean my god you know we didn't you know I have like you know sketch pads upon sketch pads of being able to pencil draw or charcoal draw or, some, or sketch to kind of talk about ideas and sit down with directors or producers or artists whoever is working with musicians to really kind of go over ideas and you know just take your eraser and pencil and sketch things and now you know you're expected to make it look photorealistic because you can and then it all moves and then it, you know so um, that is an interesting thing that's actually helpful but it's a you know it's a big curve for me as well um and then oh my god then we came LEDs what more can we take you know so I've seen these four big chunks of things come in and um and I welcome LEDs I I with, look with all this stuff I welcome it but it hasn't been without its challenges you know um and we have to do what we have to do, and it's just more people. Life goes faster. The the old ways are, you know, they're part of history. They're part of a wonderful time that I have uh, in my memory that I was able to live through. Um, and now we look to the future and what's ahead, you know. So. That's fine. Uh, in in, it could have in off off Broadway and off Broadway. Until Off Broadway started becoming a commodity, because it wasn't when I was in the in the early '80s and late '70s, there was still some freedom and flexibility with it. There were no rules necessarily, so you could do it, and some people did it, and I loved to do it. So I ran. I loved to run my own shows. Um, I certainly ran a lot of shows for other people as well when I was starting out when I first moved there, but then when I was starting to design. Um, it was part of a. Um, it 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 was just part of a being involved in, and it was part of the living part of the theater, which is what it is, and and um, and becoming another presence. You know, the fourth wall. I was the fourth wall, or the the invisible actor, um, just to be able to. Cr to capture the spirit, and it was the spirit of all this work. Mm. That's, you know, <laughs> you know, you barely get any time to mm. do anything anymore, which mm. is kind of a shame. Mm. So. Well, I think um, taking the, I, I did the facade of the building. I was, no, it sounds boring, <laughs> but the new 42nd Street studio building and it's on it's in Times Square it's on 42nd Street but the reason why this one was so special and I think I'll, I, I can't imagine ever getting the chance to create this um, 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 experience again but um, because I had uh, you know was an established theater designer in New York but I just a, a few years after that when I moved to uh, LA to work for Disney and st and really s started to um, produce architectural projects for Disney in theme parks or you know whatever I was doing a lot of things and so I knew both worlds I was I knew how to do both things and um, there weren't that many people that mm -hmm. could really that successfully crossed over or wanted to cross over it was considered you know um, 
did, I don't know, I, I lost a lot of respect from people when I left to do that, you know, to, to work for Disney. However, they did teach me in a very important art. They were very uh, generous in um, showing me knowledge on how to make things last and how to be uh, enduring. So friends of mine and colleagues of mine in New York were uh, starting to um, cross over also into architecture and one of my friends, Chris Buckley, was um, who was at BAM when I was working at Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, was one of the um, technical directors there, and he became a construction manager, and he was uh, managing a new project, a new building, when New 40, when 42nd Street was still pretty bombed out, burned out, and dangerous, and the revitalization of bringing back this part of the city was uh, announced and um, was the uh, effort was underway to start projects that would make would bring people back and make mm. this less dangerous. So uh, the one of the first buildings to be worked on was this building um, that was to be um, um, a, 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 was to house big rehearsal spaces for not for profit theater and dance companies. So pl small theater companies in, in Harlem or dance companies in the Bronx that didn't have the money to rehearse or to have to showcase their work, um, you know, for anyone to see it that w could have a place to come and work. And so this building was going to be d dedicated to the arts. So it was going to be rehearsal studios, a theater inside. It was strictly going to be about the performing arts. But the exterior of the building was, um, there was a mandate by um, the city that all the buildings, the new buildings that were going into Times Square, all had to have billboards and a certain amount of signage, which was a lot of coverage of signage. Almost 50% of the building had to be covered in signage. And the, um, uh, um, the people that were behind this building, um, the new 42nd, the new 42nd Street Studio Building, didn't want to put advertising billboards on, mm -hmm. on so so we uh, with the architect and the client we went to the city and said we propose you know another way of of um, advertising and we're going to advertise what's happening we're going to advertise the arts in an abstract way and so it was a long process of working with the architects to uh, make in my um, opinion was a art piece of moving light that danced that celebrated what was happening inside was happening with the arts but abstractly um, interpreting what was going on inside so in, in essence we were a billboard we were a billboard for the arts and how could anyone say that something abstract is still not a billboard and it was light so it was exactly what they wanted but it was colored light so there wasn't anything about colored light what so we kind of um, got that passed it was the only um, project at that time that got um, kind of special exemption from having to plaster an ad by proving that this was an ad, but it was a little bit different, and nobody could um, deny uh, the uh, essence of it. And so I got to, I made, I made a collage out of the sights and sounds of 42nd Street at night. From what I heard, I camped out there and uh, with a folding chair and looked like an incense vendor, I'm sure. I mean, I know I did, because people were coming up and asking me to buy <laughs> everything but I had headsets on to the lighting console which was housed in but we couldn't bring a console on the street because it would have gotten you know it would have gotten stolen or worse um, and so I just kind of disguised myself as a street person to uh, you know hear what was going on and then I created through the headsets through my um, pr wonderful programmer and um, associate um, a collage of, of color, sights, and sounds that was happening and made them dance as the dancers would be doing in the building. So I got to create a living theater piece outdoor in an abstract, outdoors in an abstract way, taking everything I've learned, everything I learned about color from Johnny Dodd, everything I knew about movement from dance, everything I knew about spirit from the theater, um, you know, and it became a, a really important collage that is still, it's 20 years later, it's still, you can get off this subway in Times Square, and it's still, it's still 
shining it's still moving and so um, and then for the um, premiere of turning this building on um, the city agreed to shut down 42nd Street to traffic which they hadn't done in like since World War two or something so and we called it the big turn on and so um, Elliot um, uh, Goldenthal who is uh, married to Julie Tamer who did the music for the Lion King he created a soundtrack so they we had uh, musicians on the various catwalks of the building all the way up outside um, playing live it, it, to this you know kind of heralded beginning of this new technology and then uh, David Parsons had dancers that were harnessed on the side of the building that flew out from the building from ten stories up and nine stories up and it was this whole thing of music and sound and then da -da -da -da, and then the lights and we turned on the lights and the lights started going like that and it was just a huge celebration of the beginning of a new uh, dawn on 42nd Street uh, uh, of a new, um, you know, bringing life back to that area and also celebrating the arts in a big way through architecture, which hadn't been done before. So I was really lucky, really lucky to have gotten that call and, um, and put everything into it. And I, I can't imagine anything more extraordinary than that to, to wrap up everything that I had been working on my whole life and you know bringing it together because I, I knew about architecture from yeah. Disney thank you you know so anyway so that that's the answer to that one um, every night there's a different program and there's probably and it runs for about an hour you know of changing like you wouldn't be hanging around for an hour to notice that but uh, some some sequences are some sequences, you know, are five minutes. Some are an hour. They're all different. I, 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 I the Sunday shows were slower because we just didn't want to excite people too much. You know, Sunday nights are dark in the theater. Monday nights are dark. The, the you know, I, I took my cues off the Broadway schedule. So when were people going to be in? When was when were the lights in the theaters back up? You know, so I put that outside you know and so by the weekend it's really dancing you know Friday mm -hmm. Saturday that thing that building is, is so bursting with energy mm -hmm. you know? and so and those shows are faster because people are moving faster mm -hmm. so you know but now on that street there's so much more light, you know, because at that time there wasn't much more light. So the McDonald's opened up and put a thousand A lamps on their marquee or whatever. It's so bright you can't see. Madame Tussauds put so much light. There's billboards now plastered. Everything's so much light. So this thing, you have to kind of walk across the street and be kind of in front of it and then you look at it and I was like wow but when you're walking down the street mm -hmm. you're just blinded by white light from everything else until you come into that pocket of mm -hmm. where that is and it's it's still celebrating the arts over there by itself mm -hmm. you know so <laughs> Uh, yes, I yeah. LED'd it, um, which uh, wasn't to me as, as gentle and beautiful as the tungsten halogen, um, but um, it, 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 you know, I cre it was it became something else. It was bolder. It mm -hmm. was chunkier. It was you know, it was um, it was more faceted. It wasn't as smooth and filmy and, you know, um, chiffon-like. It became metal, you know. So, um, so yeah, and um, <clears throat> we m might be doing more upgrades later. Uh, they, they still continue to support the building. The, the um, Cora Kahan, who was the president of uh, that building and uh, of, the, um, of what was happening with the development, she was one of the people that was heading it she's still um supporting that building and you know so it's pretty wonderful amazing i mean e every time we get um n now having um control programs because it's really all about control you know you can tweak color you can get it you know to be more pastel you can make the get the lights to be quieter as they're moving around um, 
um, having control that um, controls both architecture and theater at the same time, so you can blend these two worlds, um, uh, is, is to me is, is great. You know, it's still got a little ways to go, if you ask me. Um, but um, but that's um, kind of a nice improvement that's kind of helped. And mm. um, um, the worst, um, you know, there's just so much um, um, excess with it's you know when when a, a company comes out with a manufacturer comes out with yet a new um, LED you know strip light or ribbon light when we've, and I'm like well why did you make one when it's not as good as that guy's over there now you don't want charge more for that why did you make it who's going to use it what are you thinking you know so there's just like you you, you could just see these you know um some of these um you know company presidents that haven't any experience with lighting want to get on the bandwagon it's like well that looks kind of cool like it's so glamorous in that world we're going to make some lights and sell them too and they just don't know anything about the business so there's a lot of gack you know mm -hmm. uh that you have to w wade through and then there's the um the question of durability so now with all these products that claim to, oh, 50,000 hours. No, they're not 50,000 hours. Your circuit boards, your drivers don't last 50,000 hours. Your heat sinks aren't any good, you know? So it's really having to wade through the um, the nuts and bolts of these things, um, which drives you crazy. So, you know, you go to LDI or you go to any of these shows, Light Fair, and as a designer, it's a full-time job, really, to keep up with what's happening because in the position that I'm in, where I'm often asked to do um, installations that need to last for a while, so not shows that are going to close in two weeks or two, year, you know, two months or whatever it is, they have to it has to last for a while. And I, f I feel, um, and it could be my Disney training, which I, you know, again, I'm grateful for. Um, that it's my responsibility to know what's going to last and what's not going to last. I don't want to put that on anyone else because ultimately I feel responsible for what I put out there. So it's really a full-time job waiting through all that stuff. Part of me likes it, <laughs> but I spend way too much time on it. But I wish there were fewer things and I wish I didn't have to prove that company wrong and that company wrong mm. it's like uh don't come over promising me things that you can't deliver you know so that's i think for me that's the that may be the worst of it that's too much mm. that's the worst of it yeah you know when i was tired um i uh had just turned 30 and I had been working pretty steadily since 18, it doesn't sound like very much, but when we're talking show after show after show after show after show, 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 show tech rehearsal, tech rehearsal, no daylight, no um, holidays, no weekends, no, and, and, and I was all excited by that, but I then found that, oh my god, all right, Prices were starting to go up in New York, and I'm like, okay, how many shows do I have to do this month to make the rent? Okay, I'm going to do this show, and this show, and this show, and this show, and um, in order to get them done, okay, I'm in tech rehearsing while this one, while this one's previewing it, and I was like, okay, I know, all right, I got to use my R30, okay, yeah, plug it in, plug it, and I was starting to cookie cutter, which I had vowed never to do with my art, and when I started knew that was starting. I didn't feel very good about it and I felt I was too young to um, to become complacent. I wasn't going to become complacent. I w wasn't going to do that. It wasn't right for me and also I had um, at that time um, was in a relationship and uh, we were going to get married and I thought about my future and I thought about my life and I'm like well how's this going to work now because I'm never home you know but I'd sure like to try this before I die and the way rate I'm going it's going to be soon because I'm working so damn much so um, I um, was offered uh, two jobs actually one of them was the um, uh, 
a, a resident designer at the New York City uh, New York City Opera at the time, and the other was Disney Imagineering. That I, because I was starting to put out feelers a little bit, but I wasn't making much serious movement. But people knew who I was, whatever, and and um, I. Um, I, I was like, I can't possibly go work for Disney now. Oh my God, are we kidding me? You know, I was really a snob, a New York snob all the way. And um, but the money that the New York City Opera was offering compared to what Disney was offering, I was like, whoa, okay, well, this is enough to make me have a second idea. And then I thought about, now wait a minute, why? I don't want to be limited here. I don't want to be limited in my art and I, I can't, you know, look at what, a million dollar budget, you say? You know, so, which could, was n never uh, possible. Um, and um, promise of nights and weekends off, which was a joke because that didn't really happen. But, um, so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to just really jump off the cliff right now and leave my security blanket of of Greenwich Village and and my theater scene and go do something else and then I'll just come back if I don't like it. Well, who knew you don't do that? But um, so it was a whole a whole different world um, <clears throat> that was um, <laughs> you know a couple of times I'm like what did I do? You know, it's just kicking myself, but too late to go back contracts, all that kind of stuff because I was so naive with theater. If somebody makes a promise, they keep it, you know, we'll write it down too. Not like a contract like this with Tiny Fine Print. Who had a lawyer? You know, I didn't have a lawyer or any of that kind of stuff at 30 years old in New York. So uh, at that time, now it's probably common. But um, anyway, so it wasn't, there was no getting out of it once they got in for a while. But it was okay because I saw things to construction, mm -hmm. and and I was being just as creative. It was different, mm -hmm. you know. And for all of the naysayers who don't like the politics of Disney, whatever. I I mean I can't disagree with all this, with many things, but to there was this whole other world of children that I didn't even think about. You know, I, I didn't end up having any of my own at the end of the day, but um, to um, shape uh, um, the visual um, excitement or, or to see what happens when children get um, you know uh, get to a place like that and and can fantasize and you know everybody's troubles are gone people go there when they want to feel happy because their lives are miserable or whatever have you or you know if they can just escape for a day and it's and, and and so much joy, and I was like, okay, I couldn't deny that mm. that that was something useful, you know, uh, as much as what anyone will say about it. Um, I found it enriching for that reason to say, wow, this is what I can do now. So, you know, it's always the message that you're doing. But, you know, lighting is so, lighting is really deep and it's really important, uh, important is uh, silly to say, but, um, you know, how, what you can do, what color does emotionally, what your response is, is, you know, if you know what you're doing, <laughs> it's very powerful and, and wonderful. So, yeah, and that was, happened. But I, as soon as my contract was up, I left after a few years and, mm -hmm one of my own to do some of the same work and, and more, so. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I did uh, theme park rides attractions, so there's this part of Disneyland in the back that was the first expansion to Disneyland in Anaheim called Toontown, and so I designed most of that, and, and rides, I, you know, well, that was fun. I did a, a black light ride, a dark ride, they call it, the Roger Rabbit ride. <laughs> and so it was like it was the first time there was a company called Wildfire. I think they're still around, mm -hmm. but they were just introducing um, a high powered, um, you know, UV black light in the housing of an eight inch Fresnel for the most part. And it was a metal halide lamp, it, it was a Philips. Uh, no, it was Al Osram lamp. I think that was uh, a medical use lamp that pumped a lot of UV in it. So I had to work with OSHA to f 
to set the guidelines of how much exposure you could get. Like you just didn't want to be too close to that lamp or hmm. you get sunburn or possibly cancer. You had to focus with, you know, with uh, uh, protective gear on and gloves and long sleeves, you know, when wow. you were. So, uh, and then years later I was, um, I was, had follow-up tests to my corneas to make sure that there was no damage from that exposure. And there wasn't, thank goodness. But, um, but that was kind of fun to help develop, to, mm. or to be around for that development of that technology. Mm. But I did restaurants for them and shops and fountains and all kinds of stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff. It was like what? But but I quit. I quit soon after one assignment where I was like, okay, that's enough. I was in Japan. They had sent me to Tokyo Disneyland to do the um, renovation to revamp the Country Bear Jamboree, you know, attraction. Which I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm gonna light animatronic bears singing country western songs in Japanese. And so, in the middle of the night, I was like, you know, this is good. this is it. This is it. I can't. I'm done. I'm done and all. But like, I, that's enough now. Okay, this is enough. This is silly. I gotta get back to it. So, um, <laughs> that was a low point actually. Um, that was um, because it. That was also new technology, which is moving um, 3D. Film. It wasn't the the 3D film was adapted so and programmed so when the car was moving through the space and and the the vehicle itself every one of those vehicles was like a million dollar vehicle it's able to you know it's got scissor lift on it. it's able to come up and down it's able to turn side to side shake and just spin and do everything nothing they hadn't done a vehicle quite that sophisticated before. But as you're going through the ride and you're going through the different rooms of the ride, you don't necessarily know you're going through certain rooms because it's a combination of um, large screen um, video, which or not video, large screen film, which was all 3D uh, film, and hard scenery that the object was to not know where the film screen started, where the scenery you know, ended, that kind of thing. So it blended seamlessly. But what they did, which no one had done before, um, is as you're moving through the car and the screen's ahead of you, if the car's going this way and you're looking this way, the 3D's coming with you. So they mapped it all out so that they had the 3D kind of change and, and move to your orientation that had never been done. Because, you know, you put on 3D glasses and you're watching, you know, anything in the movie theater and you go like that, oh, it's gone, okay, okay, well, uh, it's gone, you know. But this um, ride had, um, you know, was really designed very precisely with the assumption of where, how your eyes were going to be viewing it at what time and what angle you were at and moved mm -hmm. the 3D with you. So that was pretty fascinating. And at that time, um, it was the beginning of CG, you know, so um, there was a, um, a, a, a huge warehouse in, um, I think it was Connecticut, actually, that um, was doing all the gra computer graphics for it, um, and because we really needed to match the video to the ride itself, I had, a ser I had limitations as to where I could put lights, because the whole idea was to place lights where you couldn't see them, so it, this was all magic. So I had created this uh, catwalk uh, overhead, series of catwalks that you can get to all the, the rides, but it, even as you're spinning, you're not supposed to see lights. I mean, there might be an offender here and there, but, which was impossible to uh, prevent. But for uh, on the whole, you know, you were really immersed in the, in the, um, in the ride itself. So, I, certain flats or certain scenic walls or buildings had to be lit from a certain angle because that was the only way, that was the only position we had. So I, we had to design the space first and I had to figure out my lighting positions and then I went to work with the computer graphics people and said we c you can't light that that way on, on screen because we don't have that angle so that's not going to melt. So we meshed colors and we meshed angles. To a, for a, for it to go seamless. And cool. That I was, was four years of the, on that project. Wow. Yeah, and a year, um, almost a year in in um, construction, putting that together. You know, just really fine tuning it. It's, 
a really a wonderful experience, actually. Um, yeah, I haven't been doing very much of that anymore. I started um, working on hotels and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, theme parks are, you know, there's really a, a it's not a niche anymore. It's it's quite an industry, a big industry. And I've often, um, you know, there were a couple of themed things I was involved with, with um, Universal in terms of restaurants or shops and Disney, etc. But um, I didn't really chase down the the rides so much a anymore. There was a kind of a lull after they built uh, Universal Islands of Adventure before things were moving overseas. And then what they were doing, they did a Spider-Man ride. Uh, they recreated it in China, but they just took the people who were assisting at that time were assisting me on it and you know all the paperwork was there so they didn't pay royalties or anything they just really? lift it and move it you know so I you know you know when you do these theme parks you sign you sign it away you know this is not your property they can do whatever they want with it goodbye you know thank you very much we've got the model so um, so I didn't um, yeah I, I, I didn't pursue I started I went back to concert touring for a while so our, I, I, in a big scale way instead of small clubs but I designed like Pearl Jam and Tom Waits and Lou Reed and people so I went on the road for a while that was a lot of fun and and then I started getting calls to do hotels and architectural things and thought that was pretty cool so um, and I like doing buildings um, so because for me you don't have to pay to see that building so 42nd Street you can walk down the street and see it, you know. Mm. But then it's a piece of abstract art. But mm. to me, there's a whole idea of helping a society uh, of people that can't pay $100 to see something, you know. So it's important to me as well. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, the, the, I'll take any job when it comes in. No, I'm <laughs> joking. I, I, I just love to do all kinds of things. So I, um, you know, it's not out of the question for the future. I just haven't been actively pursuing things lately on that, you know. No, not so much. It's just um, weather proofing becomes mm. an issue um, because the weather's always changing. So I haven't done anything based on weather. I haven't programmed uh, to weather, which I know some people do. If it's raining, it might do this. But, but there's not a whole lot of it because God knows it happens at any given time and, you know, you hook up sensors and yikes but um um but what i found was that especially in new york um not so much weather like the freezing cold temperatures or the incredible amount of heat and sun that you know i mean we used to have burst uh, tungsten lamps all the time so i have to say the leds are holding in they're hanging mm. in there heat you know uh, um cold they're they're just they're okay um, but um, the thing that got me at the beginning when I did when I was working with the tungsten there that I hadn't expected was the earth moving a little bit and acid rain so um, you know we had everything dichroic and dichroic filter sandwich dichroic you know like through temp tempered between tempered glass you know it, Etc. And then, but you know, that acid rain was eking in through those seals mm -hmm. every once in a while. And then, di th these dichroics that are report were reported to never disintegrate. Oh, these will last forever. Another one. There's no fifty thousand hours. These are forever. <laughs> They're not because they haven't come across good old New York City acid rain before. You know, so just kind of <laughs> getting in there and just you know, just decimating that dichroic coating to a pulp, you know, it's like, that become powder. It just took it, you know, into powder after a while. And then the subway shake, you know, under Times Square, which you don't feel, mm -hmm. but the, because we kept finding that the lamps were blowing. This is again, mm -hmm. we were before LEDs when we were using tungsten. Finding that the lamps were blowing, I'm like what the hell? Why? Why aren't we getting the life out of these lamps? It's not the temperature, even for you know temperate times of the year when we had no problems with it, but it was the sh the 
minute shaking mm -hmm. of the subway below that the filaments were shaking. So, so Phillips did a um, a heavy duty filament right. that we were able to to uh, retrofit everything with, and that helped for a while. But I haven't had any problems with LEDs in mm -hmm. it's eight, how many years now? Uh, Eleven years with the same LEDs. Not a problem. The mm -hmm. only problems you get out is with cables and control where the cable connection, mm -hmm. the plastic cable connection mm -hmm. might get eaten mm -hmm. and then you try to stay ahead of that. But they maintain it very well. Um, you just reminded me I have to call somebody back about <laughs> me doing that. You know, because I do a lot of different things. I also sometimes do residential projects mm -hmm. or large landscape projects. So. I will occasionally get a call to go back and tweak something or mm. upgrade something or whatever. Um, but um, it's, it's a problem when you build build them to last mm. that you you know you kind of short yourself out of a, being called. We need you. It's because they don't need me anymore. Built to last, you know. So maybe I better take my own you know learn my own lesson from that and start <laughs> making things a little less durable. I'll make more money, but yeah, not not a whole lot. Um, I think the uh, advice is to be um, to be open to all the different parts of uh, or all the different areas of lighting design. Um, uh, you know, some people go with exactly what they love and they want to be in the theater and stay in the theater. And that's great. You have to you have to know what life you want, and maybe there's a different lifestyle you want at different stages of your life, because um, there are certainly with what we do, there are certainly extremes with all of these different lifestyles that you know it's like you want to honor your circadian rhythm, don't go into theater, you know, um, etc. Or figure out how to be healthy doing it. It's, it's how to stay healthy and how to stay vibrant and how to stay engaged and not get stale. You know, there's a lot of things. So really, you need to do your research and your homework and, um, and, and think about kind of what you want. Um, and this is coming from someone who, when I started out, didn't think very much about it myself. But I was open to everything that came in, I, you know. So you have to kind of be open because the um, lighting uh, industry, are we doing good? Mm, yeah. Um, uh, the architectural industry is a $10 billion industry. And the leaps in technology and the introduction of shaping the art in terms of design is incredible. You go to Europe and you see what they're doing. It's like, it, and it's all, not all, but many people from theater that have been crossing over. So I think it's the blending of of all these mediums that are interesting in addition to, you know, projection and, and video media and all that kind of stuff. It's really pretty amazing and very exciting to get involved in it at this point. Yeah.